in game nine, Fisher gets absolutely battered out of the opening into the middle game. He's completely lost. He's battered all over the chessboard, but somehow he manages to keep going and keep going and keep going. And in the end, he managed to swindle a draw. As Capablanca remarked, the good player is always lucky. An attacking player, Fisher plays the Sicilian, but he notes in this position, not in this position, in this position, instead of bishop e7, he preferred the line queen b6. He says this line's much sharper. And you know, he played that in the future, and that line still stands up to analysis. Fisher notes of this move, bishop b7, is that it was a slight inaccuracy. What he should have played is uh, an immediate b4. Because what we have got in this position, we've got the opposite side castle in set up, well, potentially, uh, where both players are throwing pawns at each other. And it's kind of a, a bit of an arms race. So I think the idea of bishop b7 is just a little bit slow in the position. And as Fisher himself noted, he says, I played this move in game 15. This move's just an outright blunder, right? Uh, I don't know why Fisher's not played b4. He keeps talking about playing b4, but this move just allows White to sort of press forward the attack against the Black King, and it's it's a crushing attack, and it's unbelievable that Fisher actually survived it. So you're white in this position then. So how do you continue the attack against Bobby Fischer? What would you play in this position? Knight d5. Knight d5, get into a key square in the Sicilian for white. And right, so this is essentially a pawn sack after one of these pieces take and pawn takes. We're opening lines against the black king. Now, for example, if uh, black you know, leaves that, that knight on d5. There are going to be tactics in the position. And like, this is an amazing move here. So can you find this fantastic move for what for white? 9e6, white, what a move, right? It's not surprising that these tactics are here because white is in such a strong superior position. And um, for example, if takes, then check. And this is just curtains for uh, black. And you know, in the position, if queen comes to d7, then we're just on this square. Right, we can even afford to throw in a little cheeky check in in that position and then do it that way. So fish is getting battered, you know. White is like plus 10, plus 7, plus 6 in places. It's like, it's like crazy. So Fisher praises this next move, right? And But the computer finds something even better, which which is interesting. So in this position, uh, what would you do as white? Two good moves here. There's two different directions in which you want to take it. And in the game, white takes the pawn and takes the queens off like this, uh, which should be decisive. Uh, but the computer does find an even better move which is to keep the material on the board, keep the threats in the position, and A4, not A3, A4, right? A4 is a really nice idea, obviously. We're threatening this, we're threatening to take, open up more files against the Black King. Uh, but, you know, white, Black can play B4, but you get such a possible continuation. Rook takes. If Bishop takes, for example, we can just take everything off. And promote like that. Either of those two possible continuations, you know, at this level, you know, even at club level, is probably enough to win the game, but not in this case. So, what would you play as White in this position? Fisher said if White would have played this move, he would have resigned, right? He would have resigned in this position. So, in the game, White played the rook to a8. 
But Fisher says if you play the rook to e8, it does resign the game right there and then. Because you can see why, really, because if we do play the rook to e8, and these two pieces are basically tied up to the defense of this pawn, right? The, the, the dual threat of this pawn. The rook can't take this because uh, the bishop controls this square. And if, obviously, rook moves anywhere, we just the bishop falls. We try a bishop to g7, then we just take the rooks off and promote that way. So these two pieces basically completely tied down to the defense uh, of this pawn. And the bishop's very useful as well, can always anchor it if it needs to in a certain position. And then the idea is that if the king moves, for example, we can just play and we can just bring the king into the game with these two pieces tied down. Game over. But that didn't happen. But, uh, game adjourned and Fisher starts to feel a little bit like there's a swindling prospects on the horizon and yeah okay still white has got two pawns after these pawns get exchanged on the queen side but we have got opposite colored bishops so maybe he starts to think he can swindle this especially in time pressure well there's no mention of time pressure but Fisher certainly gets his swindle and let's just have a look how that happens so there's a bit of maneuvering around with these pieces so I'm going to quickly flick over. We're going to get to a key position in the game in a moment. So rooks come off, and now we've got opposite colour bishops, but we still have the advantage with these two pawns. White's still plus six in the position, but, you know, it, if you don't handle these end games correctly, you can throw the way all the work that you've done during the game. It can be so frustrating, but let's look how that actually happened in this position. So the key move coming up, the key mistake coming up is now A4 throws away the win. And, you know, I'm no end game expert by a long way, but your know, master level players probably will be kicking themselves at A4. The correct method is B4. So this is a line given in the book. And then I've just continued it on a little bit for a bit more demonstrative purposes. So King A5, the idea is like black tries to block the second pawn, but black's just going to be in such a at a certain point. It's going to have to move the bishop. And when he does, the pawn can come in. And then it's just going to be curtains because we're just going to push the pawn and promote. And that's what white should have played. This goes to show that these king and pawn end games are really tricky. Fisher held the game in the end. You can see that white can make little progress. And the key position to get a draw comes up in a second. There, so we've got the bishop, you know, blocking the retreat of these two pawns. And it's a draw. Phew! So I think you've got to feel a little bit sorry for white in this game. They played a really nice attacking opening and middle game. But just a couple of minor points in accuracies and a couple of mistakes along the way allow Fisher to get back into it. And I'm sure Fisher learned an awful lot from this game. So thanks for watching this video. I'm doing a playlist of all of these games. Eventually, there'll be one a week, one or two a week. So if you've not seen any of the previous games, they're available to watch now.